Good morning, TC. Let's give it for Jesus all across this place. Come on. Man, we are so excited to have you guys with us on Resurrection Sunday. Turn to your neighbor and say it's a good day. That's right. So now look at the person, your second choice on the other side of you and say, Happy Easter. All right, man, it's good to have all of you today. And uh, man, all of you in overflow rooms online with us, man, thank you guys so much for being with us today. It's a packed house here at TC. Have a look around, man. It's a beautiful to see a church that's going to look like heaven. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, man, we're super, super excited. How many guys remember the bomber jacket era of the late 90s, early 2000s? Y'all remember them starter jackets that were way too puffy? You know what I'm saying? You got to rock your favorite team, right? I was, I was, a, I'm a, cow, I was a Cowboys fan, was a Cowboys fan, was a Cowboys fan. That's what we were like, you're not a real fan. I'm like, well, they're not a real team anymore. So you figure that out. So, uh, but I remember, I remember rocking the bomber jacket, man. And I remember I would wear it to the fair because you either, like the first edition, you remember had the Velcro flap. Then they went to the zipper. All right, so some of y'all remember. All right, so uh, our, you could go to the fair, and if you were going to ride, you know, the ring of fire, you could open the pouch, put your stuff in it, close the pouch. You don't have to worry about losing all of it, right? Of course, back then, when you went to the fair, it was actually cold, right? Y'all remember the cold fairs we used to have? You're going to ride the ring of fire, you're getting frostbite in your nose, and it's all worth it, right? And so uh, I remember going to the fair, rocking my bomber jacket, man, and uh, it was so cold, uh, you know, that was back when we used to wear long sleeves at Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Uh, and as time has gone, you know, it's gotten a little warmer. Now we're wearing flip-flops and tank tops uh, at Thanksgiving, which to me is a bummer because I like, I like it cold. But nonetheless, uh, I remember growing up in that time frame, and uh, then things got warmer. And as things got warmer, I remember traveling with my parents to New York for the very first time. We were going to New Jersey and New York. And and so here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm still pretty young, and so uh, we're, we're, we're getting ready to go up there. We're going to visit some churches, go to the city. It's going to be awesome. And so uh, I'm packing some clothes. I was single at the time, so you, know, you never know when you're going to find you know, a nice Christian honey up in New York. Uh, to, so I was like, bring, I, was, I was matching all my clothes, shirts that match my shoes. And I'm, I'm doing the whole thing, you know. Um, and so I, I'm packing everything, and, and we get it's late in November. Right, we we get up there and and uh, we get off the plane, and it was one of those situations where you get off the plane and you go into like one of those tunnels that's outdoors, and I get in that tunnel and it's freezing. <laughs> and my dad looked at me. He said, "Did you pack a jacket?" And I said, "What for?" It is eighty degrees at home, <laughs> but it was thirty four degrees when we got there. And all I had was short sleeve shirts, some shorts, and a couple pairs of pants. It was bad news, all right? Um, and so I was like, man, it's freezing. And, uh, but I was like, man, I'll be all right. He's, he, and, he, and so he says, I'll be right back. He comes walking around the corner with a leather jacket. And he says, here. And I was like, that don't really match none of my outfits, my guy. But, uh, <laughs> and he said, so he's like, he, he, he gives it to me. And I'm like, uh, so I, but it was so cold. I, I put it on, right? And it hit me in that moment. And then even as I was thinking about today, it kind of hit me in that moment. It's like, man, how often are we thinking more about the moment than we are the future? Matter of fact, if we were honest, we all live in the middle of our lives far more than we think about the end of our lives. And here's what I know. In life, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Am I right? So in life, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. And if we were all honest, whether we think about our careers, whether we think about our families, whether we think about uh, the things that we buy, how we spend our money, if we were all honest, we live our lives believing that the middle matters most. We, we live our lives believing that the middle matters. Like, I mean, I'm going for that, that big career. I'm going for that right job. I want that right income because the middle matters most. I, 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 I mean, I want to make the right amount of money. I want to find, you know, someone that I can live the rest of my life with. Why? Because the middle matters most, right? I, I want to find the right income. I want to get the right house. I want to get the right car because the middle matters. Say it with me. Most, right? And so we live our life believing that the middle matters most. And so we've built our life that way. The thing is, is when Jesus comes on the scene, he actually has a different story. When Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus says it's the end that matters most. He says the end of your life is what you should be far more concerned about than the middle of your life. 
So here we have this situation where I'm trying to be and obtain and accomplish everything in my life for the middle of my life. And here Jesus comes on the scene and he says, the middle of your life matters, but where you go at the end matters more. And how many of us would acknowledge, at least within our own self, that that's not where our mind goes to first. That's why John 5, 24 says it like this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. So he that is connected to me, he gets to go into eternal life. What is he saying? There's something after this life, right? And he goes on to say in John 12, 25, he says, he who loves His life loses it. So if you're more concerned with the middle, don't worry, it's not going to last long, he says. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Now, does that mean you're supposed to hate your life? Does that mean you're supposed to genuinely, how how many guys, we all know people that look like they hate life. Come on, y'all know y'all got sister sandpaper rubbing everybody the wrong way, right? Come on, you work with somebody that you're like, man, how are you today? Every day, they're like, no. Like, brother, do you have a good day? You know what I mean? Like, we all know what it feels like to see someone that I I think genuinely hates life. And that's not necessarily what Jesus is talking about here. When he says you're supposed to hate your life, what he means is in comparison to how great you're looking forward to the afterlife, it should look like you hate this life. And so when you compare what you're waiting for in heaven versus where you are on earth, it should look like you're so ready for heaven that you just don't even care about this life. Now, are we supposed to care about it? Of course. Are we supposed to do something with it? Of course. Are we supposed to impact other people on this life? Of course. Are we supposed to be good stewards over this life? Of course. But he's saying we should care more about the end than we do about the middle. And that's what happens when Jesus sets the tone. Now, the beauty behind the story of Jesus is that today we celebrate his resurrection. We're going to go to Matthew 28 to read this passage of story. Now, maybe you're new to the church world. You've never been in this place before. Um, let me just kind of catch you with what happened. Jesus, God in the flesh, died on the cross to pay for the sins of his people. And he dies on the cross. He goes in the tomb. But he told his disciples ahead of time, don't worry. I'm only going to be there three days. And so he go, they put him in the tomb, and that's where we pick up in Matthew 28, 1 through 6. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it like a boss. Sorry, that's my translation. You guys don't have that. I don't think that's up. Sorry. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. Say these next words with me. He has risen. And today we celebrate on Easter Sunday the fact that Jesus not just gave his life, but he rose from the dead. You see, any man can give his life, but it takes a God to raise himself from the dead. And Jesus comes on the scene and and he changes everything. And it it, it reminds me, it makes me think about the idea that for many of us, life is this unending pursuit of what we think we want. Life is this unending pursuit of what we think we want. How many of us have lived our lives going after something we thought we wanted? And, And how many of you have ever begged God for something going, God, just let me have this. Let me have this. Let me have this. And then he's like, no. And you're like, I don't think you heard me. Let me, let me have this thing. Let this thing work out for me, God. And, and, and you're praying. And, and, and how many, if you're anything like me, maybe you've experienced seasons of your life where you are asking God for something that if he lets you have it, it would have killed you. God, let this relationship work out. And God's like, I love you way too much to let that relationship work out. God, let me have this job. I love you way too much to let you have that job. Why? Because we can only see in the middle what looks good to us, but Jesus is always thinking about the end. And man, we have this unending pursuit after the things we think we want. How many of you guys have ever been around kids before when they wanted something? Right? Are they not the most obnoxious creatures in the world? Right? Why? How many parents in the room do you just let your kids just go 
completely berserk with candy right before bed? <laughs> How many of you parents let your kids go completely berserk on candy on purpose right before? No, I'm sorry, right? Like we, we, we've, you, like how many of you let your parents ha- or let your kids have Red Bull energy drinks right before bed? Why? They may want it, but it doesn't mean it's what's good for them. They may want it, it doesn't mean it's what's right. You're looking at their future. They're only thinking about what they want in the moment. And that's how Jesus treats our lives is to lead us in a way to understand what it is that we're really looking for. And when Jesus went to the cross, he wasn't just looking at the middle. He was looking at the end. And the beauty behind what Jesus did when he went to the cross is as he goes to the cross and he lays his life down. And, and if, you, if you aren't aware, every single one of us have sin in our lives. All of us have messed it up. Some of us have messed it up worse than others. Don't look at the person next to you right now. That's not the time. This is not the place. Some of us have messed it up worse than others. Some of us have a bigger rap sheet. Some of us have an official one. All right. So like, but at the end of the day, all of us, the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of meeting the standard that God has for us. And because of that, listen to me, as bad as you may want to know God, you can't. Because there's this giant void between you and him. But Jesus looked at us. And he said, you know what? I'll bridge the gap between you and God. The sin that separates you from him doesn't have to be there anymore. And when he went to the cross, he may have opened his arms wide, but he brought his heart close to know us. And at the cross, he gave his life to pay for our sins. And as he did that, he gave us all access to forgiveness. But the thing about forgiveness is that there's a really big difference between mercy and grace. You see, mercy is not giving you what you deserve. One more time to make everyone feel better in the room. How many of us have sinned before? And if you didn't raise your hand, you just lied. (laughs) And so welcome to the club. We're glad you're with us. All right. (laughs) Now that we're all in the same boat, Mercy is not giving you what you deserve. You see, we deserved hell. And when Jesus laid his life down, he said, I'm not going to give them what they deserve. Because I, I, I don't just want them to be forgiven. And he didn't stop at mercy. But the reason we celebrate today, we celebrate his resurrection, is because his resurrection paved the way for grace. Mercy is not giving you what you deserve, but grace is giving you what you could never deserve. You see, could he have forgiven us to where we don't have to experience hell? Yes, and that could be the end. But then he resurrected. He defeated death. He defeated the grave so that he could give us grace. He didn't just make it to where he could experience death so that we didn't have to experience death. He made it to where he experienced life again so that we could experience life again. His resurrection paved the way for us to experience him in heaven forever. And that's why John 14, 6 says, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's why the verse that we all know so well, John 3, 16, your your grandma probably has it hanging in a hallway somewhere (laughs) over the stove, spackled with spaghetti sauce or whatever. For God so loved the world that Jesus gave his life and God gave his son. God gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but would have eternal life. And that's the beauty behind what Jesus came to accomplish. And so let me just help you because Jesus is always looking at the end. Jesus says this. Look at me just one second. Jesus says, I'll choose you in the beginning. And I'll forgive you of the middle so that you can be with me in the end. I'll choose you in the beginning. I'll forgive you of the middle. Listen, everything in the middle of your life you think disqualifies you, Jesus saw that and chose the cross anyways. He saw it. You have not shocked Jesus with your life. You didn't make that decision and Jesus was like, no, no, no. I'll forgive the middle so you can be with me in the end. And there's certain songs and certain stories that really put this together so well. And today we want to sing one of them and share a story of somebody that God highlighted and brought them 
to a place where the end mattered more than the middle. Let's sing with our team today and watch this video as we see the gospel show up in someone's life. part of it. So I, I originally came from Texas um, and it wasn't the best. I will be completely honest with you. My mom had me when she was a senior in college um, and so my biological dad was in the picture for a little bit but then kind of ended up st stepping back and when I was about six years old he just wasn't in my life. I did have my stepfather, Jeff, he was incredibly abusive towards me and my mom, and it got worse when my little brother was born. So not the best home life. And I dealt with that pretty much all the way through high school, and it, it got progressively worse. Sadly, religion was actually one of the tools that was used, my stepfamily specifically, was actually used as a tool of abuse towards me. You know, I was just kind of against all religion, just didn't want to be a part of it at all and it was actually meeting Dakota he was like yes I'm a Christian you know um, I do go to church and stuff like that and I was like well I'm not but Dakota expressed the desire to start going back to church you know I know this great church it's TC you'll love it and I was like all right I love you so I'll give it a try there was a huge struggle and there was just a wall and a block between me and God maybe I should just give up and just, I will never be good enough. But over time, like that wall slowly started to get chipped away. Pastor Brad does it after every service, you know, he does the, you want to be saved or you want to invite God into your life. Pray this prayer with me. And I prayed it out loud. I was like, I'm a little scared. I don't know what comes next, but I feel really good. It was actually uh, my idea to get baptized. And he was like, are you serious? And I was like, yes. And he was like, I was thinking the same thing. And I was like, great. The baptism itself though, that, was amazing. 
Pastor Brad dunked me in the water and like pulled me back up. And that was the biggest moment for me because I, I one of the things that I, I dealt with is I never felt like I belonged anywhere. And that just felt like God was opening up his arms and saying, welcome home. in the gardens, amen? He takes the dead areas of our life and he, he brings life to them. And I think that's the beauty if you wanna be seated for just a moment. I think that's the beauty of what Jesus comes to do in our lives. John 10, 10 says that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. He comes to wreck things. He comes to take things from your life. Jesus says, but I've come that you would have life that you would have it to the full. And what he means there is that I've come that you would have eternal life. That you would have something in the end that matters. But I also came that this life that you're living right now in the middle, you could live this life to the full. It'd be something that means something in your life. And I know for many people, they've grown up in church environments where church religion, and honestly, even Jesus was more a set of rules than it was a fulfilled life. It was more something that you went to, not something you were a part of. It, was, it wasn't always great. And I'm, I'm here to tell you today that if you've had any of those pictures of what it means to have Jesus in your life, and it's not, it's not the way he wants you to see him. I want you to understand this today. God doesn't wanna rob you of your life. He wants to give it to you. He doesn't, want to, doesn't just wanna take some of the things from your life. He wants to give you life. He wants you to experience real life. I know for many of us, it's hard to, it's hard to understand the value of something 
when you just don't get it. It's hard to know why is Jesus so important when you don't quite understand. And that's why I know it's easy to live life without something if we don't know how good it is. Where are my, uh, where, where are my Rugrats, Doug, and Rocket Power people at in the house? Where y'all at? Y'all in here today? Come on, late 90s, early 2000s. Where y'all at? Where y'all at? One more time. All right, very good. I remember watching, I remember watching this episode of Doug because that was my jam. And uh, I was watching Doug and, and on the sh- uh, this whole episode was about him eating sushi with his grandma and he never had it before. He was, so him and Skeeter, we're gonna, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Some patty mayonnaise. Some of y'all are like, what? Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And uh, so him and Skeeter were go, gonna go eat sushi with his grandma. And I was like, I ain't never heard of sushi before. So I went and talked to my mom. I was like, mom, what is this thing about sushi? And she was like, ugh. Sushi's gross. And I was like, well, what is sushi? You know, and she was like, it's raw fish on rice. Now, I should have known better. So I come from a, a southern white house, which means we only do one, fi- one thing with fish. Fry it. Matter of fact, we've opened that up to all food groups. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You, oh, you want a pork chop? Fry it. Chicken? Fry it. I thought I had him beat one time. I said, how about cornbread? They said, we call it hush puppies. Fry it. All right, so, and uh, so I, I remember I was talking to her. And so I had, I, in my mind growing up, I had this whole thing where sushi was absolutely terrible. And then I tried it one day. Changed my life, man. That's so good. I might go today. Y'all watch. But I remember trying sushi for the first time. I was like, this is incredible. And I was thinking back to my, my parents. Like, so I asked my mom, I was like, have you ever had sushi? She said, nope. <laughs> I said, well, then how do you know if it's any good? She said, I just know. <laughs> I think for many of us, you know, my parents, they had the information, but they lacked the revelation of what it was like. And I think for many of us with Jesus, we've got enough information that we're making a decision, but we lack a complete revelation of what he could be in our lives. We know he wants to change something. We know he wants to be our savior. We know he died on the cross. We may may know some of these things, but we lack the reality of what he wants to be in our life because he's the only one that can make life be lived to the full. And listen to me, he is the absolute only one that can make sure that the end matters more than the middle or the beginning. He's that kind of God. And that's why in James 5, uh, 4, 14, the Bible says that, you know, your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, but then it's gone. Some, some translations, you may know it better to say your life is but a vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. In other words, it feels like a long time to us, but it's not that long. The end has to matter. And I'm inviting some of you today to think about how the end matters more than the middle. And you go, Brad, I don't even know. I I just don't know. I have a hard time logically processing what Jesus did for me. And I, and I, I remember the story of the jacket at the airport. And towards the end of that trip, I was with my parents and I overheard my dad tell my mom how much he paid for that jacket. Cause it was from one of those stores in the airport. See, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so, it was a leather jacket from a store in the airport. So you can just, you do, you do the math. And, uh, and so I went up to him and I was just shocked. I said, dad, what, you paid that? And he was like, yeah. I said, that's, that's way too much. And he said, I know. I said, it's not worth that. He said, I know. I said, that doesn't make any sense. He looked at me and goes, I know. I said, then why did you pay that much? He said, because you needed it and I wanted it. I think for many of us, we look at Jesus and we think about what he did on the cross and we look at him and we say, but you, you, you paid too much. And he goes, I know. And you go, I'm not worth that. And he goes, I know. And he goes, you, you should, I I said, you should have done it. I go, you. You didn't have to do it. You you paid too much. I know I wasn't worth it. I know this doesn't make any sense. I know. And you go, why did you do it? And he goes, because you needed it. And I wanted you. You needed it. And I wanted you. 
And you could not have me if I didn't do it. You needed it. And he wants you. And to him, the price was worth it to have you. Can I invite you today? Let go. Let him have your life. And I promise you, he'll do far more with it. And by the end, you'll realize what he's doing. Eternal life and this life to the full. So how do you do it? How, how, what does it look like? What, do, what, do you do? what am I asking you to do today? I'm asking you, like I had to learn going from Florida to New York and knowing that you got to pack the right things. Listen to me. Spend your life preparing for where you're going, not just for where you are. There's something coming at the end of this life. Let's, let's prepare for where we're going. And I can't help but think of the hope we could have. Think of the hope we could have if we realized that the end awaits all of us. And it's actually the doorway to the beginning of eternal life. At the end, it doesn't end. For those of us that are in Christ Jesus, that's where it starts. And today, God's ready to start your journey. So I wanna invite you to do that today. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for your life. God, we thank you that you sent your son to pay the price that we could not pay. As we say here at TC, you live the life we could not live perfectly. You died the death we deserve to die because of our sin to give us eternity that we did not deserve. And I pray, God, that for all of us in this room, you help us see that you're not trying to take something from us more than you're trying to give something to us. And today I pray that this would become a reality to all of us in a greater way. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did at the cross. But it's not just that you died, it's that you resurrected that gives us grace into eternal life. We thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. If you're here today, you're in this room, you're in the overflow rooms, you're watching online, you say, Brad, I know that I've got things in my life that have separated me from God, but today what I know is I'm ready to give Jesus my life. And the Bible says to be forgiven of our sins and to be saved, all we have to do is put our faith in Jesus, our belief that when he died on the cross, he paid for our sins. And today, if you're ready to put your faith in him, today, if you're ready to root your belief in him, today, if you're ready to let him lead you towards the end more than you pay attention to the middle, then I'm here to tell you he's ready to meet you. And today, if that's you, I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me. And this prayer doesn't make you saved. This prayer is just putting words to what you're believing in your heart. And that's that Jesus paid for your sins and he's now the Lord of your life. But we're gonna pray a prayer out loud together to make a declaration. So let's do that, church. Let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me my wrongs. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. And through your life, through your death, and through your resurrection, I can be saved. So I give you my life. Make me brand new. Give me a fresh start. And I'll follow you through the middle to the end. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. TC, let's give it up for all those that prayed that for half for the first time. We celebrate with you. Awesome, awesome, awesome.